All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are welcome to, this today, uh, to today's One Planet Week lecture. As you know, um, the topic is green chemistry and zero carbon in your home. And um, my name is Anietje Wisdom Williams. I'm actually studying uh, for a master's degree in green chemistry and sustainable um, industrial technology. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope that it gives us an opportunity to talk about um, everything as it relates to green chemistry. And then you'll be wondering, uh, like, um, wh what concerns me and green chemistry? Probably you're not doing something that relates to it. I hope that you find it very, very interesting. OK, so to begin, um, we have to just start by talking about the problem. Um, I actually got these pictures from one of my lecture slides. Um, what we see here is a statement of the problem that we have before us. The picture on the left talks about the kind of pollution that we see and how a lot of people point accusing fingers to chemistry, saying, like, if we didn't have chemistry, we would not have all this problem. This is emissions that is coming about uh, behind the man there. And you, obviously, you see the man wearing a nose mask, not because he's um, running away from coronavirus, obviously. <laughs> it's because of the pollution that is there. So a lot of pollution that we have, um, I think that this picture was, take, uh, was drawn by a kid who was trying to state a problem about the environment, and then was um, just put it in, in graphics, and we see how um, a little child just says so much about what the world is right now, and then we think that the problem is chemistry. But is chemistry really the problem? Again, um, so many problems that we could identify, um, waste disposal, uh, accidents, people say, oh, why do we have this accident? Probably if we're not doing this. If chemistry was not before us, maybe we will not have all these things. Maybe, maybe we're not going to have the pollution that we have. Just maybe we're not going to be having this kind of depletion of resources. Maybe we should, not, we should do away with chemistry. Like, just a lot of people have, have engaged in conversations with people who just think that maybe if we're not doing chemistry in a bit, maybe we'll be safe from um, all the problems that we have. But again, is chemistry the problem? Is chemistry really important? That's part of the things that we're going to be considering um, today. So the first question I'm going to be asking you to imagine is, imagine a world um, without chemistry. Yeah, as much as we try to point accusing fingers to um, chemistry and people say, oh, of course, we know, we know everything that surrounds the climate activism right now. Everybody says, we don't need airplanes again. We don't need this and that. But just imagine how the world would be like without uh, innovations around chemistry, um, without um, the creativity that science and particularly chemistry brings before us. Um, this is just an illustration of what we have right now. Um, as far as many of us that like ice cream, I hope you know that it's chemistry that brings about ice cream. Yeah, so what we're saying, this is food. That's your devices that you have. A lot of us use mobile phones and all of that. Um, textile as well. Everything. So you cannot look anywhere and not see chemistry in it. Even the clothes that you're wearing right now, the chair you're sitting in is actually made, um, comes about as a result of innovations behind chemistry. And so this statement that 97% of all goods are manufactured using at least one chemical reaction is really, really true. In fact, maybe it's 100%. Because there's nothing that you can turn to across the world right now where you do not see the finger or the hand of chemistry in it. Everything, just absolutely everything, is made up of chemistry. So I think that with this slide, I'm trying to explain that chemistry is not really the problem. All right? And that's where the concept of green chemistry comes to play. So what I'm trying to do here is, um, Try to differentiate between brown chemistry and green chemistry. Again, I got this picture from, um, okay, I'll, I'll explain that later. But um, this is brown chemistry and then this is green chemistry. So um, this was the picture I, I, I illustrated in the first slide of how a child tried to illustrate how the world was for him or her and then stated the problem, stated emissions. You see um, spillages going into the waters and all of that, and then probably the child will be thinking, we see how the plants have withered away. The child will be thinking, oh, if we do not have all these things, if we do not have these emissions, if we do not have this spillage, maybe this water will be safe for us, maybe this water will be safe for the um, fishes that live in it, and all of that. But then, that's, what, that's just like an idea of brown chemistry. But what green chemistry is all about is trying to say, okay, yeah, it's true that chemistry is really important, but can we do it in very, in very cleaner ways, in better ways, 
And so this picture was just modified again um, to see that we have plants that are really doing so well. Obviously, they are doing so well. I hope you see that. <laughs> okay, so uh, they are, like, the flowers are really coming up. And, and then we see that there's actually an industry cited here, but yet emissions are not going out. So that's, I think that this just explains what the concept of green chemistry is. Because even just yesterday, I was actually um, at a panel discussion. I was engaging somebody, a lecturer in the University of York, who had absolutely no idea of what green chemistry was all about. Like, if you tell somebody, oh, I'm studying green chemistry, like, what's that? Like, what's green chemistry? They know that chemistry on itself is tough. Then why add green to it? And so the idea of green chemistry is just about being sustainable in whatever you are doing. All right? To say, OK, yeah, we know that chemistry is really, really important. But then we can do it in really, really better ways. And so instead of producing something that will put, um, create a lot of emissions to the environment, um, we could actually do um, things in different ways. And so the question you'll be asking is, how does this concern me? How does this concern me as an individual? And maybe you are not somebody that is working in the industry, yeah? So you, you'll be asking yourself, like, how does this relate to me right now? So, but before I explain that, I would like to state that one of the things that we are green chemistry is anchored on is on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them. And if you look at it in its entirety, you'll see that for every 17 of the goals that are, that are listed here, we have green chemistry as a very, very important um, factor in it. Yeah, for all of them, we want to talk about no poverty and how if we do not have the industries, we could not, we could not create the kind of employment that we have right now. If um, I, I, I showed you about ice cream in the first slide, of course, because of the ice cream, some people stayed away from hunger and all. So basically, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal that we are all aware about has a very strong anchor on chemistry. But then, um, green chemistry majorly focus on goal 12, which talks about responsible consumption and production. Now, that does not mean that um, green chemistry is actually entirely focused on that. If you look at um, goal 7, for example, affordable and clean energy, you see that it is green chemistry in itself, but it has to apply to people that are actually working in industry and all of that. But so what I'm trying to do here is just to try to bring it to us as individuals. How does green chemistry relate to you? And then the sustainable development goals. You see that um, if we become more responsible in our consumption and our production, then I'll be talking about that in, in subsequent slides. But then um, just to give us an idea of what the United um, Nations Sustainable Development Goal 12 is, well, in simple statements, um, the sustainable growth um, statement says, achieving economic growth and sustainable development requires that we urgently reduce our ecological footprint by changing the way we produce and consume goods and resources. So it means that in that little decision that you're going to be making as an individual, you could actually impact or in influence the ability to achieve these goals. So considering how to change the way we produce goods, okay, that might not so rest solely on you, but the second aspect of it, consume goods and resources, that's what responsible consumption is all about. And then just to give a bit of statistic, um, this was taken from the United Nations uh, website, it says that global population is estimated to reach um, 9.6 billion by 2050. And so it means that we need almost three planets to sustain the people that will be existing on the Earth by 2050. And you wonder, like, can we actually have three planets on Earth? Absolutely not possible. And then you have 93% of the world's 250 largest population uh, companies, sorry, are now reporting on sustainability. So why have I put this here? We said that we have to change the way we produce things. But then this statement from the United Nations Development um, website as well is saying that 93% of companies are already reporting on sustainability. That means they're actually considering changing the way they produce. So it means that a lot of responsibility now lies on our own part. If industries are taking steps to be responsible in their production, how about us as individuals taking steps to change the way we actually consume some of these stuff? And so just to give us an idea, again, I'm going to be talking about this, but just to give us an idea of what the three pillars of um, sustainability is all about, basically, um, 
if you want to define uh, sustainability, you just have to look at it from three perspectives, environmental, social, and economic, right? Like, so if you want to be sustainable in your, um, in your lifestyle, if you want to be sustainable or responsible in the way you consume food, you must look at it from three perspectives. Okay, how beneficial is what I'm doing to the environment, all right? And I know that ma majorly for most people, this is where the focus is. So if you go to the supermarket and you want to buy something, you want, you want to ask, okay, which of them is cheaper? I think that's the question that most people ask. Nobody goes a step further to ask, okay, how is what I'm buying impacting the environment? I'm going to be giving us some examples, some practical examples of how we could do this. Okay, and then social as well. How is what I'm doing, how is what I'm consuming affecting the social standard of living in my community? I think this is very, very important for us as individuals, for every of the um, 7 billion people on earth currently, if we begin to think about these three aspects of what sustainability is, and we make changes and adaptations to our lifestyle, then probably we'll be contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So just to bring it home to green chemistry now and give us a, a general overview of what green chemistry in itself is all about, is what I call the 12 commandments. Actually, the 12 principles of green chemistry in context, but what are they? Uh, prevent waste, maximize atom economy, less hazardous chemical synthesis, safer chemicals and products, safer solvent reaction, improve energy efficiency and all of that. So you want to ask, okay, so how does this, how does all of this concern me? I'm going to be pointing out some of them as it applies to us as individuals in our homes. Remember, um, the idea of this presentation is just to um, think and ask yourself, how do I improve? How do I become more sustainable in my lifestyle? And so I'm going to be basically using these 12 commandments or these 12 principles, some of it to just drive home um, certain points. So the first one here, prevent waste. Yeah, globally 1.3 billion tons of food is lost or wasted. So when we talk about the fact that we do not have enough food to go around the, um, uh, everyone that's living on planet Earth now, and yet the United Nations still reports that 1.3 billion tons of food is still wasted. I think that that should ask, who are the people wasting the food? If we say that, oh, we don't have enough food to go around, but yet we are still reporting that 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted, then who are those wasting it? So it means that the people that, have more, that are fortunate enough to even have food available to them still waste it. And that should take us to the slide I talked about, the three concepts of, environmental sustain of, of sustainability, considering the environment. How does food wasting affect the environment? When we throw food they waste, you know, how, how does it affect the environment? How does it affect social standard of living in the sense that, okay, we might have enough to throw away. How about those that do not really have? Saying that... Um, um, rap, um, RAP research shows that 6.6 .6 million tons of household food waste a year is in the UK. So 1.3 billion tons of food in the whole world, 6.6 .6 million tons of it is in the UK alone. So I think that that, that, should, that should create um, some questions in our mind, all right? Like, so there's so much amount of food waste that's uh, being generated in the UK. And then over 70% of this is edible food. So food that can actually be eaten by people is actually uh, being thrown away. And then studies show that the average person can reduce their food waste by 15 to 20% or more. The question now is, why do they not do this? We know that, okay, everyone can actually reduce their food, by, their food waste by 15% or 20%, but why do they not? I think that is because people are not conscious of their lifestyle. People are not responsible now to think that, okay, whatever, to think about the implications of what decisions they make, the implications of what um, consumption, um, things they consume and what things they throw away. I think that if people become more responsible, uh, if people become more conscious of their decisions and choices, then probably we'll be able to achieve that. But the first thing is realizing that there is a problem. Realizing that not just the industries create the problem alone, but we are part of it, right? That if every one of us can be conscious enough to reduce the amount of food waste we generate, then we'll be, uh, cumulatively, we are going to be contributing to reducing 
this, um, the, the data that we have there. And so how do we prevent waste? Um, how do we reduce food waste? The first thing is to plan ahead. Like, many times we just go to the supermarket. I think that it happens to every one of us. You just go to the supermarket and then you just want to buy something. You just see something that you like and you buy and then you go home and you want, like, you become, you just don't like what you buy again and maybe you just take a few bites and you throw it away. So you have to plan ahead to think that, okay, now I know that there's a problem. Now I know that a lot of people do not even have access to this food. I have it. Why am I throwing it away? So plan ahead, buy what you need yeah buy what you need but eventually you might buy what you need but it might still be excess the next step is to store correctly right many people actually do not want to store food i have i've actually interacted with a friend that says if she cooks food and then it just she just cooks it and and eats it once and it remains then the rest she can't eat it again so she just throws it away so you have to think about storing correctly realizing that there's a problem and thinking about storing correctly Cook the right amount. I don't know how many of us actually quantify what we cook to know oh, this is what exactly I can consume. You know, we're trying, we're trying to talk about bringing green chemistry to our homes now. This is exactly what I can consume. All right? Then why do I have to cook more than that? So cook the right amount, eat, eat all, or store leftovers for later. Have you, have you thought about this before? Like to think that. Okay, I do not actually need so and so. Have you consciously decided that? Like, have you thought about it before? I think that we have to now really, really consciously begin to make those kind of decisions, those kind of choices. It's about being responsible in our consumption and being uh, responsible enough to know that we do not have to create the amount of waste that we are creating. And then beyond um, waste stage again, this slide, rather than waste, why not think about recycling? So for, for this slide, it is beyond food waste now. All right? We know that we have talked a lot about uh, food waste in the previous slide. But rather than wasting something, why not recycle it? I think it was, it was, it was in, in the last Christmas, because this was my, the last Christmas was my first Christmas in the UK, that I realized the problem around um, Christmas jumpers here. You know, where I come from, when we buy Christmas um, jumpers, a child can wear Christmas jumpers for as long as maybe six years, and when the child finishes wearing it, he passes, passes it over to his younger ones, and sometimes it just goes like that. Because they just think, oh, what do we need a new Christmas jumper for? But when I came here, I saw that people can buy Christmas jumper every, every single Christmas. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's exactly the problem. Like, you just know that you want to feel good, you want to wear something new, but yet, you, people do not think to say, how does this imply on my environment in terms of environmental sustainability as well as sustainability as well. So um, for this, we have to think about recycling. This is the normal route of most people on Earth now. They take, they make, they use, they dispose, and because they dispose, they pollute. All right? But what green chemistry says is that when you make, you use, you reuse. All right? You reuse. After reusing, you think of remaking. I'm going to be showing you a slide on that that will emphasize this point. So instead of thinking of showing, okay, this does not serve the purpose that I'm using it for again. Can I use it for something else? We have to now become that conscious. And then if you cannot remake again, you think of recycling. Now, recycling responsibly. It's not, I think it's not just about just identifying a recycling bin and just throwing something away. You have to now be very, very conscious of how you're actually recycling. Now, this is just... And information, do you know that recycling a single can of aluminum drinks can can save enough, enough energy um, to power a TV for three hours? Did you know that? So when you think about, there's what we call the life cycle assessment in, um, in green chemistry. When you think about the way an aluminum can is produced, the whole process it goes through. I just think about that. If I decide to recycle that can, if I consciously decide to recycle that aluminum can, then I might be saving that entire process again. And in that regard, I might be saving enough energy. So when you think about the cumulative effect of that choice alone that you are making, and think about how if everyone be begins to make those conscious thoughts and decisions in their respective homes, the implications it will have on the global, um, on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this is not good. This is preferable. Okay, I've took this picture and added it to this slide this morning. I think it's one of the work of um, the Green Chemistry Impacts 
uh, volunteers, and I, I, I don't know whether how many of you have seen this in your toilet here, even in the university. I realized this when I came to the UK, so I think that we all should realize it as well. Save water, use the half flush button. A lot of us, when we just go to the toilet, ha, ah, we are relieved. And you just, you just flush everything. This is half flush, this is full flush. So, do you really need to use the full flush? Sometimes the half flush will take everything away. Like, so, you have to now become that conscious to say, if I use the full flush, I'm actually, I might be generating waste in terms of water. So, why, why don't I become more conscious to say, look at the statement here, use the full flush where, not just necessary, but absolutely necessary. So maybe you have, a, you have, you have, you have, you have, you have defecated something that is very stubborn and you flush the first time, you flush the second time and you refuse, then use the full flush. But if it does not get to that, it is absolutely not necessary. All right? Because more than one billion people still do not have access to fresh water. Do you know that? Yeah, more than one billion people still do not have access to fresh water and excessive use of water contributes to the global water stress. So that little decision that you are making in your homes, by just thinking about flushing your toilet alone, is actually contributing to the water stress on the globe. Okay, so beyond recycling again, to take your decision a step further is what we call the five R's. All right, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle. I think it, ha it has to do with being more conscious and responsible now. Now, I've used this pyramid just to show the order of how your decision should be. Okay? If you, how many of you have gone to the supermarket and looked at something from the sustainability perspective? You know, I pointed out in the first slide that, in one of the first slides, that most times it's the economic benefit that we look at. Oh, how cheap is this? Is this cheaper or is this? Like, I do that a lot. So, but most times, for now, from now, we should just begin to become more responsible to think about stuff from the sustainability perspective to say, refuse to buy or accept products that can harm you, your home, or the environment. All right? So it's not just about you alone. It's not just by the cycle of company that you have, but even your environment as well. Now, I think that almost all um, chemical products that we buy have the um, content of it like what, what they used to produce it and all of that. But how many of us consciously look at it to say, well, what's the implication of what it is that I'm using? We have to become more very, very conscious to say, oh, if this is not good, I'm going to be showing us in the next slide, if it's not good, why don't I refuse it? Okay, but if you know that you have gone to a step where you cannot refuse something, why don't you, why don't you reduce the amount of what it is that you are using? All right, okay, okay, this, this thing I know is really, really not good. Why don't I just reduce the amount of it to say, okay, if, for example, plastics, if we know that you can really, really not live um, without plastic, why don't you reduce the amount of plastics that you have? I think that that's, that's, that's the point. So if you cannot refuse, reduce. If you cannot reduce, reuse. So, okay, if you think that, oh, I can't do without three chairs. For example, if chairs were bad, if I, I can't do without three chairs in my home. But every year you keep buying three chairs, new three chairs. You have to reuse to say, okay, if I used to buy chairs every year, then why don't I think about reusing those chairs maybe for five years, just become more conscious with how I keep it, how I conserve them, and then the ability to reuse it. Okay? So you have to reduce. Uh, well, this, this, this picture was supposed to be here. I don't know how it came here. It has to do with potatoes. Like, you know you cannot eat as many potatoes. Why don't you reduce the amount of potatoes you are eating? Because you know that if I cook the entire potato, I will not be able to finish it. You should reduce it. And then repurpose. This is what I was talking about. These are boots. All right? And then somebody has used it to say, instead of me throwing them away, why don't I use it to, um, as a vase, right? Vase that you call it to grow flowers and all of that. So you have to repurpose and take something that you, want to, that you, you think you could use for something else and use it for something else. So these are the kind of decisions that we can be making from the green chemistry perspective to see how we could actually contribute to United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. All right? And then the final choice, which I emphasized in the previous slide, is recycling. All right? So if you have thought about everything and you know that there's just no way out, just think about recycling to say, okay, uh, I know that I couldn't have done without this thing, 
But instead of me contributing to the environmental stress, why don't I think about recycling? So that's last but not least. Use that option if all other four options won't work. Okay, so safer solvents. One of the questions you asked about the green chemistry principles, safer solvents, chemicals, and products. I'm going to be driving it home to how it affects us as individuals. The first one here is dry cleaning. Yeah, if you take your clothes to dry cleaning, for example, have you asked what, I think that's becoming more responsive, have you asked what kind of um, chemicals do they use to dry clean your clothes, for example, and what are the implications of those chemicals environmentally and socially? Now, the PEC, perchloroethylene, is actually a very good dry cleaning agent that most dry cleaners use, but it is carcinogenic, all right? And then we have options of liquid carbon dioxide and surfactant, which other people still use. But of course, if you want to weigh the two of them, you might think that the first option might be cheaper, and anybody that wants to become more sustainable in their dry cleaning procedure might become more expensive. But when we go there, we're like, this is too expensive. But I think that the option now should be holistic to say, what is the environmental implication? The, the idea is trying to become more greener in our decision. That's the idea behind this presentation. And so, and it, it has to do with the kind of choices that you are making, making conscious choices. Bleaching agents, for example, we have hydrogen peroxide-based bleach that is actually really, really efficient compared to the very popular ones that we know, dioxins and furans. This might be sounding really strange to you, but I hope it's just getting hope the, the point. Most times, you have to just be really conscious. You could just do a quick search on Google to say, what is the implications of the chemicals that I'm using? And say, how can I reduce? The amount of it. And then um, paint as well. And then the ones that we all know, biodegradable plastic. A lot of work is done in the um, Green Chemistry Center of Excellence, for example, around um, generating um, PLAs and all of that from cornstarch and food waste. So a lot of things that we could think about, a lot of things that we could think about, the choices that we're making and decisions that we're making to think, to say, um, okay, what is the implication of this thing that I'm doing? On, on the environment. So one of, um, I think this is um, principle six, improve energy efficiency. I have to include this here because I, I, I went to Scotland for an host UK activity and then I visited a family that was actually burning coal in the house. I was like, like does this happen in the UK? Like they put something like this, put wood in, in, like in an, in, an, in an enclosure like this, and then began to burn it. Say, oh, the, Scotland is so cold, we need to be warm, all of that. And I, said, I, I, I began because I'm a green scientist. Yeah, I've, I've been studying green chemistry here now for over four months. And I asked the, the, like, she's an elderly lady. I was like, this is not green. She said, what is green? Like, she was asking, what is green? What, does, what do you mean by green? I said, this is not green. Like, this is not sustainable. Like, what do you mean by sustainable? We have been doing this, like, before you were born. So but I think that um, we have to now begin to decide. If you go to um, underdeveloped communities now, you see that a lot of people still live with this. It's not familiar, but this is burning of firewood to make food. All right? It's actually not sustainable. We talk about the kind of emissions that it creates, the greenhouse emissions and all of that, and then the uh, energy inefficiency that it comes about. So we have to now begin to decide. If I have the option of burning gas, for example, and using electricity, which of them is more sustainable to me? All right. When we talk about green chemistry as well, um, and we talk about the environmental implication and all of that, um, it has to do with okay, deciding on which of which when you have different energy options, which of them is actually more sustainable and all. So we have an electric cooker here, and then we have a microwave. Microwave. If you come to the green chemistry, for example, microwave. <laughs> absolutely popular there. So just by switching LED, um, LED light bulbs could save you 35 pounds per annum. So to say, oh, it's just, it's, it doesn't have to be about your environment alone. When you make conscious decisions, you're actually saving yourself money. That's the truth. So by switching the LED light bulbs, you could save up to 35 percent, up to 35 pounds per annum. So many people, when they go out, they just leave all the lights on in daytime and it's not ab ab absolutely no use. It's actually contributing to the uh, energy, global energy problem. Um, boiling only the water you need for tea 
can save you six pounds. Have you thought about that per annum? Many times when we want to boil, we just want to take tea. We don't measure, we don't quantify the amount of water we're boiling. We just fill, it, fill up the jug, boil water, take the one we need for tea, and the rest just cools down. We have actually wasted energy in that way. So we have to now begin to become more conscious in our homes to say, um, um, how much quantity of um, tea or water do I need for tea? And then become um, consciously designed of it. So you have to turn off the lights off when leaving a room. And this can save you 14 pounds a year, all right? Okay, and then what this emphasizes is that there are a lot of work around um, greener sources of um, energy. We have, this is the solar, I'm sure you are aware of it, and then the wind as well. So companies, um, government and all of that are making conscious efforts to switch from coal burning and all of that. But we as individuals too must begin to make those decisions as well. So the question is, do you always need a warm bath? I think this question, was, this question was asked in a panel discussion yesterday. Do you really always need a warm bath or you just want to have one? All right. Would you prefer a shower or bath? Now, this statistics was taken from a website. 90% of people that took these statistics preferred to use a shower than a bath. Now, the question is which of them generates more water waste? Obviously, you know that if you, if you are bathing in a shower, you, have, you are creating more water waste because you are just running something down. But if you are using a bath, for example, you are conscious of the amount. A bucket cannot take more than it can take, all right? So to say, oh, do you really, really need a shower or you could just take a bath to save water? Those are the kind of little decisions that we can make as individuals. Yeah. I hope you will start thinking about it from now. So use renewable feedstock. I was trying to think about how do I drive this home? And then I stumbled into this picture from um, the Uni University of York Sustainability team. And it says that I pledge to eat one plant-based meal a week. All right? You are on your own. I've not pledged that yet. So. But the point I want to make here is using renewable free stuff most times has to switch from using um, fossil, um, fossil derived stuffs to, um, can I say biomass materials, plant materials, and all of that. A, work, a lot of work around green chemistry is centered on generating energy from plants, biomass materials. I think that that's, that's the reason why I had to take this picture here. So, but also, in deciding the kind of food that you eat, you might be contributing uh, to the carbon footprinting. We have going vegetarian can half your carbon footprint and being vegan can cut your carbon footprint by, by 60%. But the idea here is just to use, um, think about using um, more renewable feedstock in whatever decisions that you are making. So this is the implication of everything that we've said so far, how the little choice that you're making um, can contribute to uh, the global uh, perspective. What we have here is the difference between a linear economy and a circular economy. This is like the cradle to grave approach. We take, we make, we use, and then because I'm not responsible in my choice, because you are not responsible in your choice, everyone just dumps everything that they use. And this is the, you know, it's not, one person alone cannot generate all those amount of waste. If you look at it from that perspective, one person alone cannot generate all of this. It's just the little choices of everyone, those little, little dumps that we create that brings about this. So you think about trying to recycle. Remember, that's the last option, trying to recycle everything that we have here. If everyone decides to consciously think about recycling and think about how this landfill will not be generated in the first place, and we could go back. So what we are, trying, what we are saying here is, um, remember I said that by 2050, we need three planets to sustain the people that we have. So if one planet can repeat, can recycle itself, you think about the cumulative effect that can have and how this can help those very, very disturbing metrics. Okay, this is not absolutely so necessary, but just to emphasize, just to bring you back to the world of green chemistry to say that um, 
unavailable food supply chain waste. Um, a lot of work in the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence, a lot of it is actually centered around food supply chain residues, um, taking food waste and trying to create chemicals out of it. So um, the idea is uh, a lot of research is going on um, in terms of um, creating more sustainable ways of doing things, moving from brown chemistry to greener chemistry, but a lot of responsibility lies on you as individuals, on us, the choices that we make at home, the choices that we make on our daily um, activities to say that um, what is it that we are doing and whatever choices we are making, how absolutely necessary are, are they. So just to conclude with this, be the change you want to see in the world by Mahatma Gandhi. And then there is never the idea of any green or sustainable process. Be responsible, always think of how you will improve. Because I think that wh why I had to include this here was somebody mentioned yesterday, oh, we are doing so much. We are recycling. We are doing that. We are making conscious choices. We are doing a lot of things. But you want to think that there is no way you can actually have an absolutely sustainable method of living. You can only have the best way of living. And so it means that every time, every day, you could think, you could decide of what is it that I'm doing? How could I um, improve whatever it is I'm doing? This is, this is a very, very familiar quote in the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence um, to say, oh, as green researchers, as green scientists, you must have stumbled into a research to say, oh, this I've gotten into a very, very sustainable way of doing this stuff. I've gotten a very sustainable way of doing this things. But if you look at it, you are actually still unsustainable. So nobody can be perfectly sustainable. But what we could do is to become more responsible and always think of how we will improve. Just a few slides. Thank you for listening. Um, and thank you, special thanks to Dr. After as well for um, inspirations behind some of the slides and all of it. Thank you so much. And the, uh, my colleagues on the Green Chemistry Center of Excellence as well, thank you so much for, for coming. <laughs> so, yeah, we're finishing time. Do we have questions or contributions? Yes.